Today I'd like to speak about a few incidents in the interaction between a very odd couple in history, a friendship that developed between Benjamin Franklin, the deist, and George Whitfield, the evangelist. And um, I'd like to begin by quoting words taken from the book of Acts regarding King Agrippa and the Apostle Paul. Again, a real odd couple, if you will. As Paul spoke of the interactions that he had had with the Lord, how the Lord spoke to him and revealed himself, and how he himself had been saved. Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. To which Paul responded, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. By the time uh, George Whitfield came to America, Ben Franklin already uh, had an illegitimate child, was in a common law relationship um, with a woman. He was an avowed deist. Um, and yet, he was drawn to Whitfield. He was not impressed with the local ministers when he attended church. He was bored, didn't feel that they were really addressing the moral issues of the day. And yet he saw in Whitfield a reality and, and uh, ended up publishing his sermons in his Philadelphia newspaper. There's a famous story about... Uh, Ben Franklin attending one of Whitfield's open-air preaching sessions, and he was standing at the back of a crowd, and he began to think about these reports that Whitfield had been able to preach to tens of thousands of people in the open fields in England, and he wondered if that was really true. And so he began to move backward from the back of the crowd until he could no longer hear the words that Whitfield was preaching. And then moving forward, he calculated an area, giving two square feet per person, he estimated that as many as 30,000 people could hear Whitfield in his preaching. Now, Ben Franklin's family, they were, during the Reformation, they left the Catholic Church joined the Church of England eventually, the Episcopalians. But his father and his uncle Benjamin, they identified with the dissenting preachers. And eventually, that was primarily the reason for his father leaving England and coming to America to seek religious freedom. And when Ben Franklin wrote his autobiography, he addressed this to his son, he said, and now I speak, this is at the beginning of his autobiography, and now I speak of thanking God. I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence, which leads me to the means I used and gave them success. My belief of this induces me to hope, though I must not presume that the same goodness will still be exercised towards me in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse, which I may experience as others have done, the complexion of my future fortune being known to him only, in whose power it is to bless to us even our afflictions. And so while he did not embrace uh, the teachings of the Bible, primarily the gospel of Christ. He was engaged with George Whitfield on many occasions in discussions about this. It's interesting how much he respected his father and his mother. Now, he was the son of his father's second wife. His father had, his first wife died, had seven children, and then his second wife had 10 children. Ben was the youngest son. He was the third youngest child. And so the father actually had 17 children. And um, Ben Franklin 
raised a memorial at the grave of his father and mother in Boston in which he had inscribed these words, Josiah Franklin and Abiah, his wife, lie here interred. They lived lovingly together in wedlock 55 years without an estate or any gainful employment. By constant labor and industry, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably and brought up 13 children and 7 grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in filial regard to their memory, places this stone. And so Ben Franklin, although he uh, in many ways was not always a model of uh, what should have been a moral life, we know that he was a womanizer and so on, Yet uh, Whitfield never gave up on the man, just as Paul, preaching to Agrippa, pled with him, a man who was miles from him as far as his worldview. He didn't give up, and Whitfield didn't give up on Ben Franklin. One of those appeals in which he wrote to Franklin, he said, I do not despair of your seeing the reasonableness of Christianity. Apply to God, be willing to do the divine will, and you shall know it. About a dozen years later, he wrote to Franklin again. This was after Franklin had discovered um, some matters regarding electricity. And he said, as you've made a pretty considerable progress, this is Whitfield writing to Ben Franklin, as you've made a pretty considerable progress in the mysteries of electricity, I would now humbly recommend to your diligent, unprejudiced pursuit and study the mystery of the new birth. It is a most important, interesting study, and when mastered, will richly answer and repay you for all your pains. One at whose bar we will shortly appear has solemnly declared that without it, quote, we cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You will excuse this freedom. I must have something of Christ in all my letters. I am yet a willing pilgrim for his great name's sake, and I trust a blessing attends my poor, feeble labors. And so, although Ben Franklin acknowledged that he never put his trust in Christ, yet to uh, Whitfield's dying day, Benjamin Franklin admired and valued George Whitfield. And, you know, I think this is often the case. We, we see recently that the right-hand man of one of the leading atheists in the world um, has recently turned to Christ. And so we shouldn't give up on these people. When we think of a man like Saul of Tarsus, who would ever think that Saul of Tarsus would get saved? And yet, this is what God can do. And so we need to to redouble our efforts in praying for these people. If only these people could get saved, what an impact they would have on our society. So think about this. Realize that no one is beyond the reach of the gospel and that we might gloriously see this and be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I wish that not almost, but altogether, you might become a Christian.